starting. I'm Theo Downs-Gwen, the director of the gallery. Thank you all so much for being here uh, this afternoon. I'm very, very pleased to be proud to introduce Julie Green. I'm also really gratified that we may use all our chairs for the first time ever. <laughs> so that's a huge compliment to Julie. Um, Julie will be speaking for about an hour with uh, adequate time for questions and answers as well. And uh, as many of you know, Julie teaches at Oregon State University. She was born in the Yellow School, Japan, and uh, moved to the U.S. as a child and worked in various places and has done various things, but all unified by art. Uh, Julie is best known for her Last Supper project, which I'm sure has connected many of us here to her artistically. And, uh, this exhibition is her first solo exhibition in a commercial space in Portland. Uh, the work that's here, which I hope you'll be able to spend some time with if you haven't already after the artist talked, is quite extraordinary. It's been a pleasure for us to install and live with over the past few weeks, and even the planning process was amazing and delightful and um, idiosyncratic as it all things to do with. <laughs> I'm not going to say a lot about her background and qualifications. We have a lot of that available in writing if you wish it, but uh, a couple of recent recognitions that she received in 2011 the John Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant. Get that right. And much more recently, she won the Art Prize in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which I'm sure many of you know is a, kind of a, uh, a strange beast. It's uh, half a popularly voted on prize and half a juried prize. And, um, Julie was nominated for and won in one of the categories of the Jury Prize, which was about um, just before this exhibition opened. Very exciting. So thank you all for being here and Julie. Thank you, um, Theo, for that warm introduction. And um, I'd just like to thank uh, Theo and Heather and also Mario who photographed the work. It's been such a pleasure to work with them at up for the gallery's been open for two years, and I have been monitoring the gallery with great interest, uh, and so excited about the artists that they are showing, and now I'm in that group, so I'm so excited. Leigh, can you hear me in the back? Is my volume okay? Is the volume okay? Yeah, so if, uh, hi, it's so great to see so many friends and neighbors uh, and colleagues. And uh, if you can't hear me in the back later, raise your hand, because I think it's very dull to be in a lecture where you can't hear. Um, so, um, well, and actually some of the people in the audience, too, I wanted to point out um, Deborah and Jim Gang, where um, Deborah showed the first large exhibition of the plates, hi Deborah, um, in Etopia, 100 plates, and recently gave me um, some of her, her father's Flow Blue, which is in, uh, an influence for some things I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Um, so thanks for coming, and thanks for the plate, and Jim for the Airbus set, as well as uh, other people who helped that way. So I'm going to actually grab a platter and start with that project. You don't have to move. I'll bring it to you. It's actually been uh, a priority for me to have work that I can carry, so it's all portable and I can lift everything, although sometimes it takes a long time if there's a lot of pieces. Um, so this is um, one of four things I'm going to be talking about today. This is, uh, it, it is and was my grandmother's china. Uh, it's a Noritake set that I grew up with, and we had many fine 5 p.m. dinners, you couldn't be late, or uh, Sunday dinner as well, and Thanksgiving. So I always appreciated her great cooking, and inherited these dishes, which have um, pink and gray flowers on them, which looked great at her house, and our, I actually realized when I inherited it that I didn't like the pattern at all, and I liked it around for 30 years. And then I thought, you know, I could paint over that, I don't want to do that. And so I actually wanted to mimic um, Flow Blue. This is um, European Flow Blue, and I was thinking more Japanese, but they're similar, but it's an int intentional running of the blue pigment. And so I, I'm into science projects, and I started just uh, playing around with I knew from the Last Supper project that you can paint on the back of the plate. I, I put the um, text of the state and date in, it's seven up and cobalt, and it, it doesn't run, it stays, it, 
it stays stable so you can work on the front of an oil and material so you can pick up one side and put it in the kiln. So I thought, well, I wonder if I could use that 7-Up and Kobo and make it run intentionally. And that's what I did. So this is either simple sugar or Kobo uh, on the front. And I'll just read you the back because I think it's a good introduction to me and my work. So this is called An Embarrassment of Dishes. And I just quickly listed, it's sad that I could have so many, a um, hundred or so uh, in my sketchbook, just off the top of my head. It was really actually almost disturbing how quickly I could list a hundred things back from childhood. So here's some. Being late, 1975 onward, she said, don't ride a motorcycle without a helmet and don't marry a black man. Mom's red around Italian sunglasses. Hated in the 70s, now I have, wear, love. Um, text read, prison panty, instead of prison pantry. Uh, Janet one, Janet two died, don't name fish after friends. More embarrassments than dishes. Let's see. Um, I'll just pick one or two more, there's actually quite a lot on here. Scott on Bible to look taller. Family photo of Des Moines, Iowa. So you get the idea. Oh, um, yeah, that's probably enough. They're, they're long. So um, that's that's that project, and now it's functional ceramics, and I, I, I like it a lot better. <laughs> when did you do that one? Just a few months ago. I just did it. That project, is that what the question was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah what did I do? I just did it. It was before the show. Um, so all this work is actually brand new. Um, just finished before the show. Um, and so, um, let's see, a little bit more then about my background. Um, I was born in Japan. My mother was a home ec teacher, and she was wildly supportive. Um, so in our Iowa home, we had Japanese, <coughs> Ceramics, we had beautiful British ceramics, English ceramics, and then uh, quilts and things that the carpenters in my family made. So a lot of handmade. Um, and my mom um, could, she sewed my clothes, and I remember going and choosing patterns with her and choosing the fabric, and then it seems like before I could walk, I could also sew, and I would choose the patterns and choose the fabric. So that definitely influences my love of, of uh, textiles and uh, fabric, and that's been a lifelong interest. Down the street from us in Des Moines, the, the art piece that was my favorite growing up was the corn cob installation that the guy made, uh, the gentleman made in May. So it was like a huge Paul Bunyan, huge American flag, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and that was just out in all weather and how it would like look when snow came. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, not a formally trained artist, but a neighbor who, who did great stuff with corn cobs. Um, and then also, we did go to museums, and that was, um, what my folks did that, for, my mom did that for me. She had somewhat of an interest, but she knew I was interested, so we went to museums whenever we traveled, and um, it seemed that everyone in my family and all my friends loved Impressionism, and they loved the color blue, so I took a, a stand against those things at an early age. Um, so contrary to popular belief, I'm actually not a big fan of the color blue, except for, um, Ceramics, like I just love how a sweet potato looks, an orange sweet potato on a blue plate. That's really a good combination. Um, and so the, the, the paintings actually came from a response, well, I'm, I'm going to all stay in place here. Um, when I went to the University of Kansas, I was exposed to contemporary art and high art. Um, and for example, was crazy about Francis Bacon for a week. and. Um, then for a longer period of time, Faye Jones and Baselitz and uh, many others. Uh, and I guess I wanted to mention too that I'm going to give a lecture on the Last Supper project uh, in a few weeks at, as a visiting artist at PNCA and the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. So if you haven't had enough today, um, at 6.30 on the 1st, I'll be talking about my full body of work, uh, including that project. But today, of course, I'm just going to talk about what's in the gallery. Um, I guess that this work is, the work on the wall is a response to painting The Last Supper. I wouldn't have made this work if I hadn't made that project. 
Um, and so it's a, it's a 16 year since I've been doing The Last Supper, and, and I divide my studio year in half, where half the year is um, fifth, about 50 final meals, and the rest of the year is whatever else I'd like to do. Um, that's my studio life, <coughs> and teacher and other things too. But So this last time I finished the 2015 plates, I'm, I can't remember when it was, must have been early in 2015, and I decided to um, work with Theo and we would be showing here. And um, I thought, okay, what do you want to paint? You know, what are you going to do? And I thought, well, I could paint food. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, oh, that's really, really? Is that what you want to do? And, 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 and what color would you want to make it? And I thought, well, I could, I could do blue. Um, <laughs> and, and at first I resisted that, and I thought, that's okay. If, if that's what you want to do, why don't you do it in a way that surprises yourself? And um, so instead of being very representational, like I am on the, the plates, if you have a chance to look at the very narrative, and these ledgers, which are something I've kept for a long time, I can't even do the math, um, 20 years or something, um, they're very narrative. And I, I, I didn't want to do food stories. Um, so uh, I, 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 I paint an egg tempera, I teach egg tempera. I'm actually in um, a world of art in showing my egg tempera and I do a video demo. It's actually on my website if you're interested in traditional egg tempera, or my version of egg tempera, which is more tra traditional than what we're doing today, what I'm talking about. Um, and so Clay, who's here, Clay Lohman, who I call Mr. Material and Techniques, is my husband and uh, partner uh, of 28 years. And so he helped me think about how I might use egg tempera in another way. And, I love airbrush and spray paint, so he helped me sort of thin the egg tempera to run it through an airbrush. And I've just always been attracted to the haziness that you can get with airbrush. And I was thinking about, um, yeah, so these had to be really quickly worked because it's, it's like painting with, I'm deciding it's like maybe whole milk or half and half. I, I think closer to whole milk. That's how the paint is. Um, because I'm staying away from dryers, like my neighbor down the way, the sign painter Sid actually helped me quite a bit with um, my, are they called guns? That sounds so, spray guns? Are they called guns? Brushes? Okay, whatever those things are. I have some. Um, they were all clogged soon because of my paint. Uh, and so Sid came and I bought him a couple six packs and we all worked it all out. But he showed me how to use things. And, but the stuff that he uses, he uses dryers and so they, you, can, you can paint very detailed and it would set right away. But those are, those are toxic, so I'm really into the low toxic materials. So these paintings sort of dictated the way they look and that it would get in and get out. And so a few of them were like one hit, like uh, this is probably the only one, and I didn't even prime it. And this wood had some kind of resin on it, so it just resisted the paint. And boy, I thought that was a great thing to happen, and I'll never do it again because I've tried a lot. Um, but most of them are sanded down and repainted, sanded down and repainted until I, I get it right. Um, and I sort of channel maybe childhood and not thinking too hard. As a teacher, I evaluate a lot of work. Some of my students are here, they know that. I, um, you know, a lot of my job is evaluation. And somehow with these, I actually didn't want to be all about aesthetics, which is going to sound, but this is just what I'm thinking about. Uh, it was more to be quite immediate, get in and get out, and, and, and look at how it looked. That, that's what my goal was. Um, and I didn't want them to look specifically, too specifically like food. In fact, did you all know they were food before you? Did everyone know they were food? Great. Great. That, that's really good. I was going to tell you. Um, so I hope that didn't ruin it for you now that you know it's food, actually. And you always wonder how much you want to tell people. George Carlin said there's no good food, so that's another reason I like to think um, Let's see. And then, I guess um, the wallpaper, um, I began that in 2011, so over here on this side is the earliest one. This is yours before up for open, and I just realized I needed a morning <coughs> practice of sitting and painting to do every morning. And I also do a video at 8 a.m. every morning, which just lately turned into a painting. I changed my medium. But I've been doing that since 2000. So I, I like repetition. You know, I like my little habits. And on teaching days, you know, it's really great to have 
uh, been in my garden for a minute and painted or potato, taken a video. Or, and now that I get up earlier, to have painted for a whole hour by 4 or 6 o'clock is, is a great way to start the day. That's all. Like, I did that. That was something. And I can actually do it in candlelight. I actually can do it with my eyes shut, which you can tell from some of these. Um, and I'll actually do that. And I actually, actually, in the flow of blue as well, I often, when I couldn't get the paintings right, I would sand them down and, and then just go out there and paint the whole thing with my eyes shut. Um, I'm monovision, so I have a depth perception thing anyway. And then also the paintings on top of wallpaper kind of address that. Only a few years ago did I realize that I was monovision, which is why driving has always been not a great thing for me. Um, no depth perception. So lately I've been thinking about depth perception, and that's why I kind of wanted to activate these paintings on top of the wallpaper. Um, but the wallpaper, when I began in 2011, Clay and I were sharing a studio space just divided by a wall, and I, um, I chose the symbol. If you later look through these books, you'll see that um, there's other pages of symbols where I'm deciding. I knew I wanted to do this project, and I was deciding on what symbol to make a commitment to, and I tried sliced okra. Um, and a Mercedes logo and some other things, that ice cream, that didn't work as well. And um, I was a pescatarian in 2011, so that seemed like a logical, the ocean, uh, that is both decorative. But then I also realized, well, the month that I started, the BP oil spill happened, so Clay had the NPR on all the time, and so they became very concerned shells um, over there, um, thinking about the health of our ocean and climate change. So I realized, actually, although I knew this, but there's actually no neutral narrative, and even if you try to get away from, you can't. So, but I still kept working on it because I know it too. And around uh, June this year, um, I felt done. Let's see, right, I can tell you where. Um, right here. I felt, maybe the this page, right around this area. I felt that I was done um, because I woke up and wasn't excited about doing it anymore. And, and I thought I have enough, because I'm a pretty good judge of space and time, and, and I thought, I'll, I'll bet there's enough work I'm done on the wallpaper. And so I counted, and I'd been in contact with Heather, like, okay, how high are the walls, and what about the door space, and, you know, like, and then I did the math, and I said I was maybe halfway done. <laughs> and so there were a few dark days around our house, and uh, Clay said, you know, paint bigger and faster. And I'm a Virgo, and I'm like, no, that wasn't my idea. I, I don't want to, I can't paint fast, and I can't paint bigger. This is, a, this is a meditative drawing. And he's like, well, then you can just cover part of the gallery. And I'm like, no, no, that, that won't work either. And so um, eventually, I, as you see, painted bigger and faster. And, and these are all sort of angry days in here, I call them, <laughs> where um, I was making up bad names for the uh, project, like Shahel. Uh, things like that. Um, so that, then there's like this transition over by Theo, where um, actually it's great to see Leigh here, where are you? Hi. Um, my colleague Leigh, who uh, actually uh, shared the tea that you were drinking, um, if you have had some tea or will, um, and also um, the Sumi brushes that I used. He gets a beautiful brushes that he brings back from China from a cooperative, and they're very, very high quality, as well as the ink. So a huge um, help. Uh, and even the, over there by Theo, in fact, right above his head, there's some, uh, above the sort of cloud-looking things, which aren't clouds, um, there's some rough-looking shells, uh, or I shouldn't say that, they look different. Um, and they're not, because they're not by me. I, rough isn't right, they're probably better, but right around here, um, and his son is like, how old is Shashu? Seven. Seven, right. So anybody who came to see me at this time, I was like, oh, I'm in the backyard painting, I can come on back. Uh, and I just, I didn't stop for anything. I'm just like, and would you like to paint? I asked him and his family. And so they, they painted a few. Do you see it? Oh, yeah, that's it. That's the one. Yeah. Right, it's really big. And there's one that looks a lot like a butt. Uh, and I, oh, it's right over there. There, Chashu did that too. It just doesn't even quite look like a shell. Um, but actually, it was the best thing about having help. I and mean, he just did like seven or eight, but it was a huge uh, psychological help. Um, but the best thing about that was that he sat down. And he had probably studied brush painting with your father, like, um, and Chashu sat there. And he took a breath and he ex exhaled, which is what you're supposed to do, you know, and then he, he very deliberately painted. And I forgot it had been like months since I had behaved properly with my <laughs> painting. And so from then on out, I, I always thought of Chashu, and I think I painted better. So that was a great lesson for me, the, the teacher is also the student. Um, 
So that's wallpaper and a mud group of friends. And then these ledgers, I can talk about those as well, just to say that, I think I'll tell you one story from the ledger, which, um, well, the, these are marked with red silk um, to the pages that relate to this exhibition. So the pages that are about wallpaper patterns or where I learned how to do my first airbrush, um, it's in here. So if you're looking through them, that's why they're marked with red silk. But one story that I wanted to mention, so these are really narrative, and that's sort of my background since a kid until quite recently was narrative paintings telling a story, usually my own, of, of things that I've seen or experiences that people have told me sometime. And there's one of a ladder on a hill, and that story I painted some years after living in New York and talking to my con ed man. So he, he was working in the building and I'm just Midwestern, you know, I'm like, would you, would you like a cup of coffee? Would you, I bake some cookies, you know? So he came in, this elderly man, he was about to retire. He came in and just sat at my kitchen table and we had a conversation. And he told me about being stationed in the South Pacific and, and he, how, how great the people were there, because he saw I was a painter, so people tell painters things, you know, about their visual life, like Con Ed guys. And he said, I, um, I had such a great experience there, and I left the, I left the ladder when we, when we left, when we were, I guess to call it, when we left, when we're not stationed there anymore, I don't know the language. Um, I, I gave the ladder as a present to the um, village. And he said, I had the chance to um, return there like 20 years later. And, and they said, oh, come here, come here, I want to show you the ladder. And so he went with them to the highest hill or small mountain overlooking the water. And his ladder has been planted there. And, and so he's a thoughtful enough guy to go, oh, how did you decide to put it there? And he, they said, well, look at all the beautiful views. So the villagers were looking, it framed, it made frames for them. So they stopped using it in any functional way. And I thought, oh, that's so great. And so I just, I just painted it in here. And so the viewers, only, only you guys, I've never actually told that story before. And the Con Ed man, of course, and the villagers. Okay, so some of us know this story. But it's just a ladder on a hill. And I think that that's something I love about art, that that the painter has one story, and then the viewer has their own interpretation. Um, yeah, I think that's all I need to say, so maybe we'll open up to questions. Um, so thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Julie, maybe you could say a couple words about the auditory component of this exhibition. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so a lot of you actually have been into our house, and maybe will recognize that there's a clicking or ticking clock in our house. That's my grandmother's clock, um, and it's sort of the heartbeat of the house to me. We don't have any TV or audio in the house proper. Um, and so as we were talking about installing the exhibition and what it would be like, I considered, I asked about the clock component, and it's a it's a um, mantle clock, and it doesn't look like it would fit here. And it was actually Theo's idea to do it digitally, so we'd, I particularly spent a lot of time listening to ticking clocks online. Um, there's a lot of them. Some are like angry clocks. Who knew? Like, or like, oh, and we're like, I got a guy here, like, like a bomb sound. Um, and so all sorts of things. Um, but we settled on this one, it's quite, it's quite similar and common. So that's, that's uh, sort of an uh, ode to my grandmother. Consider moving the clock, but she's, she's very, I have a, she's passed away, but we were very close. And even Jared, who's been a house sitter, I remember once he, he wound it and it stopped working. It's a very temperamental clock, and it, I thought it, she does, the clock does not want to come to Portland and be away. So that's why you know, we found it worked out well to have a, another one. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, please. I have a question. I, um, do you feel really um, bound by your the, by the the Last Supper project? And I know you're not talking about that. I mean, yeah. just in terms of your work, and you say you spent half a year working on that. But is it, do you feel like you're, you're constrained or limited by that? Or, or? No, I, I don't. Um, a, a 
curator um, at the Block Museum asked me sort of a, or said sort of a similar response. What did she say? Um, you know, something that she thanked me for my sacrifice for that project. And, and I said, well, it's not a sacrifice at all. You know, I'm, I'm going to be painting anyway, and I feel committed to that project. I'll be very happy to end it, you know. And, and but I couldn't do it. That's why I mentioned that this is half of my studio practice. I've had a, I have a really uh, deep studio practice that um, I wake up happy and ready to paint and talk about painting, you know, so all those things. No, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a problem, and in fact, it, it pushes me into, I think that that project pushed me into installation, which is very related to, it brings new things to my other work, so it's a compliment, and not a problem. Happy to be done with it when it's fine, you know, mm -hmm. but it's not a problem. Yeah, yeah I do. Hi, Julie. Over the years, I've seen a lot of your narrative work, and I was telling Jim that this is the first time I've seen work of yours that is not. Yeah. Which was really a, a new experience for me. Yeah. So I do remember when you told me you would be showing here. And we had a loose conversation, more your conversation than mine, I was the listener, about different ideas and exploring different things that you might want to do and might want to paint. How did you arrive at a non-narrative approach to the, the installation? Um, it happened, let's see, in the... I guess I've been head, edging for that, heading toward that for a while. In the world of art, there's um, the egg temper that's there. You can look at it later. It might take a minute to find. But I was beginning to know what my paintings looked like before I painted them, which a non-painter might think that's great. Like, how wonderful to realize exactly what. Do you see what I mean? Like, I'd have it in my mind, and then I paint it and look exactly like it. Why is that disappointing? Um, but it was to me, because there wasn't enough unknown. So. Actually, I guess it happened somewhat in the plates, too. So an embarrassment of dishes, there's about seven or eight of them that are what I call Frank Lloyd Wright Red, with that beautiful uh, color, to, similar to your hair color, uh, beautiful brickish red color. And they're narratives, so there's, I won't even tell you the stories, they're so embarrassing, the ones I can think of right now. Um, but anyway, there's a figure walking and something's happening. Um, and it's, it's in that color. And then I started, I did a few of those and I thought, you know, I can do these in text. I can make beautiful flow blue on the front and I can write this on the back and that's what I want to do and I'm going to. And I've got six that have narrations and I might pull those at the end, but then I decided that looked kind of baroque and beautiful to have those as sort of exclamation points or something, so I left them. But I, I felt uh, more private maybe too, um, that uh, it's, it, as, a, as a young artist I really wanted to tell my story and now, um, I, I can keep some of those to myself, although I could put them all in the dishes, you can see them all, um, or in the books, but a little, a little more, you have to work at it a little more. Yeah, I felt, I felt that's a shift. To the pattern, to... Yeah, I mean, those actually have always been there as a part of my process. Um, I wanted to explore the paint, I guess, paint for paint's sake, like what happened, um, almost formal uh, evaluations and rougher painting, like not being read to, with the paintings, not being read to the narration, having to stay true to getting this idea that happened, that I can just see what happens. That, this painting closest to me happened that day, I'm sure we all remember it, it was important as well, this summer when the fires, and it was that apocalyptic sulfur sky. So that painting happened that afternoon. I went out, and, and so they're actually all still narrative and autobiographical. Mm -hmm. I can't get away from that. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't even remember a lot of them. And then afterwards, all the ones afterwards that have, I started actually mixing up and allowing. So these aren't in chronological order. So the ones that have um, this sulfur color, I started after that day. There's, I think, one on each wall. There's, there's a sulfur color in the background, and there's also one right there too. So after I saw that sky, I thought I want to introduce that.
color into the paintings. So they actually probably are still narrative. They just don't tell. But they're not representation. So. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, they are actually. Yeah. But but hopefully not to you. Yeah. I, I didn't want them to be. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Could you say something about the wallpaper project and when you ask friends for uh, photographs of walls and how that relates to? Yeah. How yeah. A couple of you. I think Bruce uh, Hi uh, also submitted to that. I, a couple of years ago, I've had wallpaper on my mind actually since the late 1990s, uh, really forever. But I mean, as an art project. And so I emailed a bunch of friends and I said, could you take a photo of a wall? Didn't you submit one? They're still on my computer. I feel bad I asked you guys to do that. I, it's never realized into a project. Um, and so everybody submitted, I had about 40 uh, walls. And I was going to, I tried some samples and I didn't, and I, I didn't ever finish them. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> but um, yeah, it wasn't, um, it was an idea and I, it often happens. It usually happens in the book and nobody knows it, but um, this was more collaborative. I'll try it again. I'll try it again. See if I can make it into something. I couldn't get it to gel. I had this idea of like, is it called, the fabric called like toile? Is it the ones that have little like village scenes? Mm -hmm. and, and so my idea was that I'd take Bruce's image and Jared's image and Roger's image and everybody's image, and I would integrate it into a unified toile. Wallpaper. And but that was about the same time that you worked on wallpaper when you had the residency at in place. At Let's see, which one was oh, it? Did you paint when you had a, a half a year off to be in that? Uh, at, the, at the Center for the Humanities? Is that where the wallpaper started? Uh, it could have. Well, I wouldn't have done that because that was a research grant. Uh, the wallpaper started in my Room, I fold the sewing table down so I can't oh. sew, and I just sit there and do it every morning. But I, I, there may be other wallpaper projects. I wouldn't be surprised that I've started and left, but um, and they may come back. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned like a few times like the gap between like in the visual field, like what the artist is putting in there and what the meaning is and the interpretation that the viewer brings to it, and like enjoying that gap. I kind of wonder with all the your, do you have any thoughts or feelings like with food and food preparation? And is food like more direct, or do you feel like there's a gaps there between the way we experience or ingest food? Or how do you think about food and the way different people experience it? And yeah. Well, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I feel like at the place, like there's a gap between what people are feeling about their last meal and the way I might feel about that. When you talk about things you see when you're young, I think we probably do associate certain flavors or aromas with, and a smell is very memory oriented. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also kind of always interested in sort of like Hindu ideas of like food preparation and who prepares food for who. But I'd have to think that it's a little, almost a little more confounding because it seems like we're eating the same thing, and yet the, you know, the gaps are almost. But then, does it taste different? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, my grandma used to say that, like in a relationship, we're all having our own experience, completely different experience. I'm sure that's true right now between me and you all, as a person <laughs> on the spotlight. But, um, but I think that's really true even in any relationship. And maybe if we could think about a relationship being between the sweet potato or between the painting. You know, it, we are having, I mean, we need color. Clay and I have extensive color. He, he says he's not colorblind, but I am. But um, whatever, you know, who, who is, but we see color very differently. And I think that's right. In food, we taste it very differently. And imagine, yeah, losing, losing your sense of taste. I mean, yeah. And so these, I agree that it's a wildly <coughs> varied. I'm a food person. You know, I grow my own food. I love a lot of it. I love to cook. It's calming to me. You know, the day before my opening, I was baking. You know, the whole day just like calm down and bake. So we all have our traditions. It seems to me too, like you know, temperature is another one where it's very different the way we experience 
temperatures and things. But with food, it almost seems like when you're ingesting the same, like you look at an abstract painting, the references, we kind of think there's maybe a mutual understanding that we'll see different things in the clouds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it seems more like peaking the idea of food having but such different meaning when it's physically, you know, it's the same. Yeah, that's an, I, I'm not sure. I mean, Deborah said it really beautifully once, uh, writing a, something for The Last Supper. She said, we all have food in common. And, and so I think that, that it's like weather. There actually aren't that many things we all have in common. Uh, and we can talk about food, and we can talk about whether those things are going to happen to everybody. Or, or not, and then that's a conscious effort, or a circumstantial uh, situation. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, too, when you think of it. I mean, even if the food is experienced differently, appetite. And that ties into the last meal project mm -hmm. with like the desire for food. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hi, Ashley. Hi. <laughs> um, you touched on earlier speaking about the color of blue. You said that you never necessarily had an affinity for it, but you've had a relationship to it for a long time in various capacities. Can you talk about my new blue friends as a title? Is this like, do you have a regular yeah. relationship to the color? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that. Um, so when I decided that it would be, that I would paint on panel for this exhibition and, you know, this revered egg temper, or at least historically, egg temper is like oil painting in bronze. It's, it's a serious Western art, you know. Um, and I thought, oh, that's perfect. I'll airbrush and then I can, you know, the hierarchies of Western art, I'll mess all that up. Um, like, my former student Nathan says if you're gonna, well, let's say he came in, did I say this about airbrush and talk about Nathan? I don't think so. Okay. You know Nathan, you're smiling, but yeah, of course. Um, Nathan, he, he came in, he's like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, you got airbrush. It looks kind of like spray paint. I'm like, yeah. Uh, what about it? And he's like, well, you know, I mean, you're a professor and stuff, like, you know, what do you have to do with graffiti? And he's like, kind of, <laughs> and I said, oh! And I said, good, Nathan, because if you're going to offend anyone, offend everyone. Like, that's my name. <laughs> so I, I hope to offend everyone, I guess. Um, but the, but when, when I started painting these, the first couple ones are, are quite simple. Like, this is the first one, which is, I don't want to tell you the story, but it was the first one, and I'm learning, this is Jim's airbrush, and it's like, and I really love that, like a proper sign painter wouldn't want that, and I, I, I can't get enough of that. Um, but anyway, I painted that, and then I started doing a few more, and I was completely like having a ball. Couldn't wait to get out of bed in the morning, didn't even want to sleep, didn't even want to eat or cook. And this is like Deborah, like why, why this painting as compared to the narrative. I mean, I was really ex uh, experiencing the process of painting in a very direct way, and it had been a long time that I hadn't been a sort of... Um, very focused on the narration, whether it's my, uh, my stories or The Last Supper. So this was like cut and loose. And um, so I was doing those, and they were at my house. You come in the door here, and, uh, well, like there. And uh, actually, I can, I can see my easel from the kitchen sink, which is a criteria for me. So I can like wash dishes and look down around and see what's happening in the studio and live with my work. And so I'd come home, and I'd look and I'd see those stacked on my easel. So there was like 10 of them. If this is the easel here, they were all stacked. It looked like a shrine, exactly. Um, and, and then they would grow and there was more and more. And that's actually how I originally thought of displaying them. I, I decided not to. I was encouraged not to. But um, that's when I thought, thought my new blue friends, I can't, I can't wait to get home and see my new blue friends. So that's where the name is. So where do you, what do you, what's next for you now? Are you going to continue with this kind of thing for a while? Um, I'm d I think I'm done with this wallpaper pattern. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I barely say that. I think that's stuff like the first time in my life. I seem to, my, my mentor, Roger Shimamura, some years ago, before I came to Oregon, said to me, do you ever work in a series? And I said, no, I really don't. And I was like, and it was back for some reason, it was just like, a series, a series. And so it's been a really tight series for a while. Um, but I went to my first residency in, at the Joe Mitchell Center in New Orleans, which is an amazing place and an amazing city. I was there in, for the month of September and um, part of October. And I brought only a few tubes of paint, and I brought very little with me, and I thought, well, just this first ever residency.
residency. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't want to bring a bunch of stuff and be burdened with it. I'll just use what's there and get what I need when I'm there. And um, one of the projects that I uh, came out of that was one of the tubes of paint that I brought was called Flesh Tint, which uh, those of you that have kids you know the crayon Flesh Tint, now it's salmon, um, which is a better idea. There's a peach, whatever they call it. They, they don't call it Flesh Tint. But I was with mostly um, artists of color, um, non-white artists, and so um, we were talking about the flesh tint. You know, it's not anybody's color. It's I mean, it's nobody's color. It's a really bad color for, for skin. It's such a, a, a lovely color, but not for skin. Um, but but it's certainly not African American. And so I'm, I'm doing. I think I'm going to do some abstractions or uh, something. I'm, I'm doing studies with uh, drawing on paper that look like pores on the skin. And I'm, I'm collecting tubes of flesh tint too, which I'm actually offering to give people if you have one and want to mail it to me or drop it by, and then I'll give you another brighter, more expensive color. <laughs> new used or empty, it's a new halfway used or empty. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, so I just if I want to collect, that's going to be, I just want to see them all together. I've got about 15 now. Yeah. Hey, um, and Gamlin is calling it Caucasian flesh tint. But just in the last few months that I've seen, so it's, we're making it heaven. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Tell me about your Thank you for coming. Yes. Good opening end. It's another great yes. OSU student. Cool. Uh, you spoke about your morning practice, and I was curious about what inspired that. I mean, is that something that just started in 2011, or...? Yeah, you guys inspired that, huh. as a teacher, really. But I mean, kind of in a, in a way that I had to keep a studio practice going, you know, just... Um, to be, do something every day, and so if I, I don't know that I would do that if I was a full-time artist, that I might not need that as much, but because I'm also a teacher, um, and I'm on campus a lot, it was like, you should start the day in the studio. And it couldn't be something like The Last Supper, for a lot of reasons, psychologically and um, mess-wise. And so I just took like a clean project to sit down and do for uh, an hour each morning. And now I'm really hooked on that, I encourage you to try that. It's such a great way. Every day is a good day that you've had an hour to paint first thing. It's really uh, such a great way to start the day. Yeah. Oh, we have the ticking. Any other questions? Or mm -hmm. more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, Bruce. One question on the color. So you're making the, the blue paint and thinning it for the air brush. Are you adding any other colors, or is it just the amount that you thin uh, to get the variations in the blue? Yeah. Um, so let me study this before I answer incorrectly. I'm trying to remember. I have used a couple different blues, mostly cobalt, and then it looks like I'm mixing some white. It's and then different brands. So I'm, I'm somewhat. I had some egg chamber already in tubes um, by some A, and then I'm making my own most of the time because that's expensive in the tube. So it's cream or pigment, and it's. So you are adding white sometimes, though, to find it, or just thinning the blue that you would for easy. Most of these are straight, and like this is straight blue, straight blue. This came about because um, it didn't work the first five. You know, I kept sanding it down, so it was it was originally blue, originally white. So the color that you're seeing behind here is denatured alcohol and wet sand. And then white on top. So I'm not mixing it. It's it's a process of um, not getting. It's like blue or white, not blue and white. Yeah, but but in the sanding down, it becomes that. That one to me looks mixed. So I'm thinking that sometimes I might have like go. Oh, I I have to watch myself a little more carefully to answer that. I might like go. Oh, I think I'll add a little white, but I don't I don't remember doing that. Okay. <laughs> it's very direct. Yeah. Well, thank you for good questions and for taking time out of your um, sunny, precious Saturday to come to the lecture. It's great to see you. Thank you very much.